So the scientific name of muskox is pronounced Olobos mosharis. They're Arctic dwelling animals found throughout the world um, in the Arctic regions, which is shown here on this map. There are several populations within Alaska, which you hopefully will be able to see now circled in red. The native word for muskox is umimak, which means the bearded one. Muskox are herbivores, which means they eat vegetation, but we can nerd out a little bit more and take it a few more steps. And they're also known as a ruminant, which means they have a force chambered stomach and will regurgitate and digest their food farther. And then we can further classify them as a grazer. So ruminants are either browsers or grazers. The grazers are the non-picky eaters. They're the ones that are gonna go along and eat everything on the ground in front of them. So you can think of them as the supreme, supreme pizza eater in your family, whereas a browser is gonna be the picky eater who's just gonna go along and select very specific things off the ground. So muskox will eat just about anything. They live in groups called herds <clears throat> and similar to domestic cattle, males are known as bulls, females are known as cows, and their babies are called calves. They're a relatively long-lived species and they can live up to 20 years in the wild. When they're born, muskox calves are between 15 and 20 pounds. Um, they can get up to 200 pounds by the time they're six months old and they weigh anywhere from 500 to 800 pounds when they're fully grown. Uh, the hoof shape of a muskox is fairly rounded compared to most ungulates you're going to find in Alaska up here. Um, moose and caribou, for example, are going to have longer, skinnier tracks compared to the muskox, which is a very nice round shape. Muskox can be aged up to five years if you look at their horn configuration. So they're born without horns, but the horns start growing almost immediately. Um, by the time they're six months old, they're going to have about an inch of horn on either side of their head. And then the horns continue to grow with the animal, uh, but most of the growth and configuration change is going to happen in the summertime when they have access to good vegetation. So the chart on the background of this graph was borrowed from a scientific paper that specifically went through different aging te techniques of muskox. And so all of these are kind of um, etches or uh, graphs of what the animal would look like at different time steps. So you've got males on the left and females on the right. And then I've gone ahead and added a few pictures of what that would look like in a real life animal. So by the time muskox reach a year and a half, most people with experience with muskox would be able to tell males from females. But by the time you hit two and a half years, almost anybody would be able to tell the difference. So males are always going to have a thicker horn base and then by the time they're full grown that horn base is going to cover their entire forehead which you can see in the bottom left picture on your screen. And females on the other hand will always have thinner horns and when they're fully grown like in the bottom right picture it's only going to cover about half of their forehead. So muskox evolved during the time period when there were much larger felids and canids um, roaming the land. So they had to defend themselves against things like stuffed lions, cave lions, scimitar cats, dire wolves, and um, gray wolves, which we still have today. In order to protect themselves, they developed this circling of uh, the wagon type technique. So very similar to pioneers circling the wagon on the Oregon Trail to protect or to keep their livestock together, muskox do this in order to protect the most vulnerable parts of themselves. So when they form this circle, the calves or smaller animals without horns will circle, be in the middle as well as the animal's rear ends. And then that leaves their heads um, facing outwards. So as you saw in the last slide, both males and females have horns and they're sharp or they curve down and then they end in a sharp point, which provides a really effective protection against predators. So your bulls are typically the defender of the group and they'll make short, really quick bursts out of the group and try to use their horns to hook and toss a predator out of the way before scuttling back into the group for protection. But don't be fooled, cows can be just as aggressive and protective, especially during the calving season. So while most of these predators that helped muskox evolve their defense mechanism are now extinct, gray wolves are still extant and present throughout much of the muskox range. 
So wolves are the main predator in many of the locations where you're gonna find muskox. But there are other predators. So that includes the brown bear, which is arguably the biggest predator of muskox in Alaska today. And polar bears have also been known to take a few muskox here and there as well. Um, eagles and wolverines have been documented taking muskox calves. So in addition to predation, muskox die in a unique and strange variety of other ways. So there are the typical things like any animal in the wild, occasionally you'll have one that starves to death, but muskox also have been found drowning both in normal water, like as they cross a river, but also in strange events like ice tsunamis. They fall off of cliffs. Usually this is something like a snow cornice that develops over the top of a mountain in the winter time. And then when several muskox will walk out on um, that cornice will break and the animals will fall. There was a report of a small herd, I believe it was 12 muskox over in Europe that all died from a lightning strike. There have also been things like mineral deficiencies, heart attacks, which presumably happened during a poaching event. Uh, there was a porcupine implicated mortality. Sometimes they wander out onto sea ice and get stuck. Sometimes they get stuck on unvegetated islands. We had one case around Nome where a muskox choked on a plastic bag. Um, and the list just kind of goes on and on. They're always finding new and creative ways, I guess you could say, to die. Historically, muskox provided a really valuable meat source for indigenous peoples. Um, they have quite fatty meat, which provides a nice marbling to it that you typically only see in domestic sources of protein like your beef. Um, in today's world, they're still highly sought after for their meat. And Alaska allows for several different hunts to take place, both in the fall and in the winter. Um, you can refer either to your local fish and game office or to our website at adfg.alaska.gov to learn more about our specific hunts if you're interested. Before modern day technology, hunters harvested, who harvested muskox um, used even more of the animal than they do today. So the muskox hides and skins were used not only for warmth, but also as runners on the bottom of sleds to help it slide over the snow easier. They would craft their horns into the different kitchenware items you see on this slide, or would use them as spears to spear fish. Sometimes the horns were also used as a hammer-like device because they're so strong and heavy that they could beat seal blubber down um, in order to use it for their oil lamps. There was one report that also indicated muskox tails were turned into fly swatters, which I think would be really cool to see, but I was not able to track down an image of this. Some cultures would use, oops, sorry. Some cultures would use their bones to create things such as tool handles bows, um, arrow points, ice scoops, harpoons, and more. So in addition to their delicious meat, muskox also grow the warmest fiber in the world to help keep them warm through the cold Arctic winters. So the soft undercoat is called kiviet, and it grows in the fall, provides warmth through the winter, and then gets shed every spring and summer. So in the spring, their kiviet will catch on willow branches or peel off in bigger sheets, which leaves a very valuable fur behind for people to collect. And adult muskox can grow anywhere from four to seven pounds of kiviet per year. Historically, people would use the whole skin, again, as warmth, like I mentioned earlier, but they would also take this shed pieces of kiviet to put in the bottoms of their shoes or at the bottoms of their mittens to keep their extremities warm. Once more modern day inventions like the spinning wheel and knitting needles were created, people figured out how to spin kitty it down and knit it into other things like hats and gloves and scarves, uh, neck warmers, which are called smoke rings up here, gloves, uh, socks, and even more. Um, so one interesting thing about kitty it today, if you were to purchase a kitty it item, most likely it's going to be mixed with something like merino wool. This is because kiviet doesn't have a memory. When you stretch it out, it's going to stay stretched out, whereas something like merino wool has a memory and it will shrink back to its original shape. So most of the items that you buy that are already knitted together are going to be mixed with something else and that's so that that item has a memory to it. 
Um, all of the things along the bottom here, the different colored sky or skeins of muskox kiviet, and then all of the images on the right are for sale at the muskox farm in Palmer. And I'm pretty sure Danny would have to confirm this, but I'm pretty sure that they will ship the items if you order them online. In addition, muskox also provide a great wildlife viewing opportunity. So in Alaska, you can find them along the upper Dalton Highway. You can find them on the road system surrounding Nome. And you can also find them in domestic settings, such as the muskox farm in Palmer, the Alaska Zoo in Anchorage, the Alaska Wildlife Conservation Center in Portage, and the large animal research station at the University in Fairbanks. Um, I know at least here in Nome, people will come from not only around the state, but the country and even the world to see muskox. So muskox were periodically killed by native Alaska tribes throughout their history, although there are no reports that indicate they were the primary meat source. They're found along the northwestern coast of Alaska and a little bit inland, uh, but they were the greatest importance to Alaska tribes when caribou did not migrate on the expected pathways, which would lead to a shortage in meat to provide for that tribe through winter. The last known muskox were killed in Alaska in 1858 when an Inuit caribou hunting party came across a small herd of 13 and killed all of them. There were sporadic reports of other muskox being harvested through 1899, but none of those reports have been substantiated. Starting in 1927, the Territorial Legislature of Alaska started to urge Congress to provide money so that we could bring muskox back to Alaska. So in 1930, Congress appropriated $40,000 for a transplant. So muskox were captured in Greenland and then transplanted by boat and train to Alaska um, into a captive setting up in Fairbanks. They spent five to six years in captivity up here to help ensure that they could survive the move and were productive animals, meaning that they would continue to grow and reproduce. Once it was shown that they were hardy and did good, they were transplanted down to Nunavak Island where the population was able to grow in a, grow naturally, excuse me, in a predator-free environment. So the herd grew slowly through 1958, but then started to grow rapidly. And so by 1965, there were over 500 animals on this, uh, Nunavak Island. So because this population did so well, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game decided to use Nunavak Island as a source population for other transplants throughout the state. So the first transplant took place in 1967 when 30 muskox were moved from Nunavak Island over to Nelson Island. So Nelson Island is also an area that is relatively devoid of large predators, and so the population here could grow in a, naturally in a predator-free environment as well. This population did really good. They grew from just 30 animals to nearly 200 in just 13 years. In 1969, there was a transplant that took place up to the eastern North Slope, with 52 animals, and the following spring, Fish and Game moved an additional 11 animals to the area. Excuse me. This population peaked in the mid-1990s, between 500 and 600 animals, decreased slightly after that, and lately has been held stable at around 300 animals. In 1970 and in 1977, animals, muskox, were transplanted to Cape Thompson in Northwest Alaska. So from the 1970 transplant, there were 36 muskox released and they quickly spread out into what now research, or now managers consider their core range. Um, the 1977 transplant helped out a little bit, but this population has grown slowly, especially in comparison to the other muskox in the wild. Um, and this population is a moderate population at around 300 animals. The last location where muskox were transplanted was the Seward Peninsula. There were two transplants here, one in 1970 when 36 animals were released and a second in 1981 with an additional 37 animals. So after the first um, release of animals, the population grew relatively slowly, but it really took off after that 1981 transplant. And this population peaked in 2010 at just above 2,900 animals. 
In 2010, 11, and 12, there was a slight decrease, decrease in the population, and now the population is holding steady at around 2,300. So now that I've covered some basic information about muskox, I'll start to tell you a little bit about some of the ongoing research projects we have throughout the state. We'll start with Nunavak Island. The muskox here appear to be extremely healthy. So as I mentioned earlier, the population really took off in the 1960s, enough to, so to allow animals to be transplanted not only into other parts of the state, but also to allow for hunting to start taking place um, as early as 1975. So our biologists in Bethel have flown aerial surveys of this population almost every summer since 1981. And by using the counts that they obtained during these flights, we can document, or have been able to document rather, that this population continues to be productive, which means they have a lot of calves on the ground every summer. In addition, they also appear to be really healthy and the population seems to be regulated really well through harvest. So this presented a really unique opportunity to study muskox when they appear to be in their prime. And so we set out to work with hunters to document the nutritional condition of the muskox here. So biologists use something called nutritional indices to evaluate how healthy animals are. This can be done on live animals during a live capture. If you feel along their spine and note whether or not you feel bones, there is a fancy scoring system for this um, that biologists use. You can also take blood samples to test for minerals and diseases from live animals, and you can judge their condition of the fur. But you can also use nutritional indices and evaluate them in more detail if you utilize a deceased animal. So what do these indices look like and what do they tell us? Well, we'll start with sex. The sex of the harvested muskox is really important, especially if it's a female. So for females, we can and did ask hunters to check both for lactation and for uh, pregnancy. So that they looked at her teeth to see if she's still producing milk, which indicated not only did she have a calf last year, but she kept it alive and continued to nurse it through the spring or the winter, and also to check for a fetus, which would indicate she was pregnant. So if we take all of the pregnant and lactating females from our sample and compare it to all of the females sampled, then we can extrapolate that to the whole population to get an idea of pregnancy and lactation rates, which tells us um, gives us an understanding rather of how many females are producing and how often. We can also look at fat measurements to determine nutritional condition. So muskox will put on their fat in the late summer and they go into fall with the most fat that they're gonna have for that winter. So as winter progresses and the vegetation gets harder and harder to come by, the muskox are gonna start breaking down those internal fat reserves to help survive. So the first fat that they utilize is the internal fat around things such as the kidney and the liver. Once all that fat is used up, they start to utilize the fat on the further extremities, such as along their back and along their rump. And then the last source of food, or excuse me, last source of fat that muskox will utilize to survive through winter is going to be the fat that you find in the bones, such as the femur. So the bone marrow inside of the bones is made up of both fat and water. And so if it's a whitish pink color and spongy in texture, like in the picture on the left, that indicates that this animal is in good condition. That marrow is mostly fat and the animal hasn't had to utilize it yet to survive winter. On the flip side, if that marrow is really watery-like and really red in color, that indicates that the animal has used most of the fat from the marrow and is going to be pretty close to starvation. Or, pretty close to dying from starvation, rather. We also look at the liver because this is a good storage base for trace minerals. So trace minerals are essential to everything an animal does, from growing to reproducing to sleeping and even more. We also look at their fecal samples or their scat because this tells us what the animal has been eating. And finally, we look at hair samples. Hair samples and muskox are awesome. Um, the long guard hairs or the, the hairs that are blow, blowing in the breeze on the right animal here um, grow continuously for three to four years, which means there's a ton of information stored, of them, stored on them. 
So we can look at things like cortisol levels, which tells us how stressed the animal was, and we can look at that at different time periods. For females, we can look back and see if she was pregnant at different times by looking at the progesterone level that's stored on that hair. Um, and there's potentially even much, much more information that we can get out of them. We just are still working on how to extract that information and then how to make sense of it. But guard hairs provide a gold mine of data if you know how and where to look. So going back to the research and how we collected the information. On Nunavak Island, uh, people can obtain permits to harvest both bulls and cows. Most of the residents on Univac Island harvest cows, so we were able to go to Macquarie and work with hunters to ask them to collect this different information for us. There are also a bunch of transporters on Univac who are going to transport the bull hunters out into the field and then bring them back to town so they can leave. So by working with the local residents, we were able to touch base with almost all of the hunters. So we provided a sampling kit to each hunter which included a data sheet, a pencil, a ruler, and a bunch of pre-labeled bags so that they knew where to put the different samples. In addition, we provided um, a, a sampling pamphlet to tell them what we were looking to collect and where to find it. We asked for some basic information, such as when they harvested the animal, how old they thought it was, if it was a male or a female, etc. And then participation was and is completely voluntary. So hunters can provide whichever samples they choose. So for example, if they're going to keep the bones to create bone broth, then they don't need to provide the femur. But if they weren't going to do this, then we ask for the femur to be sent to us. So once we receive the samples from the hunters, we get to work in the lab. With each femur we receive, we measure the overall length so we can compare the size of our muskox to the size of muskox in other parts of the world. Um, after that, we split the femur in half with the salzol so we can extract approximately five to six grams of bone marrow. And then we start a dehydration process. So all of the marrow samples are dehydrated at 140 degrees for 24 hours. Then we pull it out and we reweigh it, then stick it back in the dehydrator. And so we keep repeating this process of dehydrating and weighing the samples until the sample weight doesn't change by more than a tenth of a gram. And that tells us when most of the water or all of the water has been evaporated. So animals that are in good condition, those who haven't had to utilize much of the marrow fat yet, you're not going to see much difference in weight. But if the animal is in poor condition, there's going to be a big weight change because all of the water is going to evaporate and there's not going to be any fat left. We take each liver sample and remove a small section of it to send to a laboratory in Washington where they can test for trace minerals. So there hasn't been many manuscripts published yet with trace mineral levels in muskox because it's a harder species to get access to. Um, but those manuscripts that have been published have a wide variety of levels for different trace minerals. So what we're doing is collecting our baseline information, our baseline trace mineral levels for muskox on Nunavak Island. And then we can compare that to the few other studies that have been done. But we also then will have a base starting point for what a good population looks like within Alaska. Any fecal pellets that were provided, um, we separated out five pellets from each sample to send to a lab in 2018. Um, we sent these off for something called microhistology, which is a process where biologists look through a microscope um, to look for plant parts that did not get fully digested. And then there's a fancy technique to correct for items that did, get, did get digested. Um, and then you can assign everything to a genus to see what they're eating. Um, unfortunately, we did not get our results back from this yet. And so all of the pellets from 2020 and in the future years, we're looking at alternative methods to determine their diet. So there's a couple of newer methods out there. One looks at indigestible waxes of different plants. Some look at the chem chemical signature of the plants and still others use DNA to determine what the animal has been eating. So we're looking into all of these methods to determine which one's the best fit for what we're looking to find. 
So the hair samples that we received were removed from the envelopes and allowed to dry. And then we taped them to this, we removed the hair right at the skin level and taped it to this ruler lined piece of paper. And then we cut them all in nine millimeter sections. Excuse me. Put them in these vials with a cleaning solution. And then the top middle picture there is this super cool machine that causes vibrations. So you can shove all of these capsules into there and turn the machine on and it vibrates and that causes the cleaning solution to get all of the dirt and debris off of those hairs. When that's finally done and the hair is dry again, we roll them into these tiny tins to test for stable isotopes. So what's a stable isotope? Well, everything on earth is gonna be made up of elements. The two most abundant elements are carbon and nitrogen, which makes them the most useful to biologists because every, they can be found in every living thing. Every living thing is going to have its own unique combination of both carbon and nitrogen. And when you combine that, it presents a unique isotopic signature. So when dealing with isotopes, the saying, you are what you eat, is really true. If you take Americans, for example, almost everything processed that we buy at the store is going to have some type of corn in it. Corn syrup, corn starch, straight up corn. So consequently, if you take the stable isotope signature of an American and of corn, they're going to be very, very similar. So isotopic signatures are, can change with the season. So while a muskox might eat the exact same vegetation year round, the vegetation is only going to be green and growing in the summer. And so there should be an increased level of nitrogen while it's growing when it's in its vegetative dormant state or in the winter, the nitrogen level should fall. So if you take this to a muskox, because it is what it eats, the nitrogen level should rise and fall with the season, such as it does in the plants. So if you look at one really long guard hair of a muskox, which again will grow continuously up to four years, you should see peaks in nitrogen, which indicates a summer season. So. Here's one example of what we expected to see when we ran muskox hair through the stable isotope machine. So this muskox has two very defined peaks with what looks potentially to be a third peak um, at the end of this hair. So he grew this hair through at least two summers and potentially the third summer is documented. Now that we know where those peaks are, we can go take additional hair from that animal, find the low points, which are here at peaks here at points 12 and 32, um, and test for cortisol. And this is gonna tell us how stressed that animal was in the winter. If it's a female, we can also go take care at any point when the estrogen is increasing and test for progesterone, which would tell us if she was pregnant. So if this hair belongs to a female, we would be able to get her pregnancy rate or pregnancy status for the last three years. So the cortisol and progesterone tests have not been conducted yet because we just recently got these graphs back from all of the animals, but that is our next step to go find the corresponding points on each animal and grab the samples we need to test for stress and pregnancy. So, so far, everything we're finding indicates the Nunavut population is in really, really good shape. They've got plenty of fat under their skin and they haven't depleted hardly any fat out of their bone marrow yet. Most of the females that we're getting are pregnant and or we're still lactating. So that tells us that a good chunk of the female population is reproductively active and they're active in successive years. The trace mineral results that we've received are similar to other healthy muskox populations, although there are a few individuals that have really low levels of certain minerals. Uh, we're not entirely sure what that means, so we're reading through the literature to see what that mineral will impact, and we're also looking with our wildlife, working with our wildlife veterinarian um, to get a better understanding of what implications this has. So we have one more year of research ahead of us on Nunavak Island, one more year of data collection. Um, we're continuing to analyze those hair samples and hopefully we'll have fecal sample results in the near future as well. Tell us what the animal has been eating. By the end of this particular study, we will have a robust understanding and reference levels for what a healthy growing muskox population looks like break just for a second. 
So shifting gears to the Seward Peninsula. Up here, there was a large number of bulls that were harvested starting in the late 2000s through the early 2000s. In 2011 and 12, the population declined and managers started to observe a much lower level of the ratio of mature bulls to cows, uh, at least lower than was present before the decline. In addition, they also noticed that there were a ton of calves being born each spring, but not very many of them were surviving through a year of age to be recruited into the population. So these events combined led to a theory that perhaps bulls are really important for both group co cohesion or keeping a group together, but also in protecting those calves from pred uh, predators by being the primary defender of the group. So we figured we'd start off by looking at the survival of young muskox, both neonates or those brand new calves, and also 18 month old females, which were animals that we could identify and collar. And by doing this, we could see when they die and what they die from. But before we could fully jump in with both feet, we had to somewhat test the waters because muskox research has not been done on these younger age classes before. This meant that in addition to determining how and why muskox calves die, we also had to develop a method to catch them that would not lead to their being abandoned by its mother. So in 2018, we did a small pilot project where we caught them both on the ground and by helicopter. Both of those methods are used to catch other ungulate uh, neonates with success. So after our small pilot project, we found that we preferred the helicopter method. This allowed us to approach and exit the area a lot quicker, which minimized the time muskox were on alert. It allowed us to travel farther than we could with on foot or with land vehicles. And it allowed us to capture calves regardless of the snow conditions. So between 2018 and 2020, uh, we've captured and collared 89 neonates. The vast majority of these have been sexed and a little more than half of them have been weighed, which was done using a sterile feed bag and a hanging scale. So the top picture on this slide is at the end of working up a calf, we're letting it out of the uh, weigh bag and it's gonna run back to its group. We also estimated the age of each calf based on the mobility and the condition of its umbilical cord. The collars, which you can kind of see on the bottom picture, are pleated and made of a stretching material. So as the animal grows, those pleats, the stitches on those pleats will pop off, which provides an additional half inch of space. And then at the very end, the stitches will pop off where the collar is held together and that collar will just fall off onto the ground. In addition to the stretchiness, we also added this bright orange flagging to most of the collars and that allowed us if we were coming into a group for a second time for any reason, we could quickly identify whether or not that calf had already been collared, but also it allows us to identify individuals later on down the line when we're doing observations because the furriness of the muskox will quickly cover up the collar itself. So you won't very often be able or very long be able to see the collar. In addition to collaring the calves, this past spring, we also made a really concerted effort to spend more time observing them. So this, we were watching the calves immediately post capture, and then again, 24 hours later to make sure they were still with the group and nursing. And then we also had volunteers sign up to participate in muskox observations. So these teams of people would be dropped off near a group of muskox, and they would spend up to four days and three nights in the field observing muskox interactions. They documented all the different activities calves participated in. They documented any aggression that was shown towards the calves and they observed just overall group dynamics. So at all times, they were several hundred feet away or several hundred yards away rather from the muskox and they would use binoculars and spotting scopes to observe. So while one teammate observed, the other would record on either an iPad or paper data sheets. In addition to looking at muskox, which really what else do you want to look at? Um, they also were exposed to many other different wildlife. Uh, so they were visited by things like ermine and red foxes, some ground squirrels made their presence known. And in addition to snowy owls, there were many, many other bird species that came by as well. But probably the coolest exposure was witnessing an almost bear predation event. 
So fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your point of view, the bear caught a whiff of our observers before getting to the muskox group. It literally stopped in its tracks, stood up to sniff, then turned around and took off without attacking any of the muskox. So over the last three springs, we've seen the neonates die from a variety of causes in no particular order. They've died from predation. There have been birth defects, mostly involving the digestive system, but some also involve the respiratory system. There have been various diseases and infections. There's been conspecific trauma or trauma caused by muskox. Um, there are some cases where the animal starved. There are some, unfortunately, that are forever going to be unknown. Um, and there are still a few that are open, meaning we're still waiting on some results to come back from the lab, which will hopefully tell us what that muskox calf died from. So predation came from a variety of animals. We had bear predation, wolverine, and eagle predation. There were also some unknown predators thrown in there. So predation was assigned as the cause of death if nothing remained of the carcass but bone fragments and small tufts of hair, which is in the top left picture here, or if the collar was bloody. So when we returned to the lab at the end of the day, we played CSI muskox and would spray the collars with luminol to determine if there was blood soaking into the collar at any point. So if it was bloody, such as in this picture, the collar would light up bright blue. If it was not, then we knew we had something else on our hands. Um, all of the collars were brand new prior to being put on the calves, so um, we also took great care keeping different gloves on and putting them in their individual bags so that there was no blood transfer between the collars. In almost all of the non-predation cases, which is the top right picture and the bottom picture, we came across and found whole carcasses or mostly whole carcasses. So when we found that, we would remove whatever was left and send it to our veterinarian in Fairbanks where she could conduct a complete necropsy. Um, sometimes we could tell right away that that calf had probably starved to death because it had lost weight from when we captured it, but we would still send it in for a thorough necropsy anyway. Um, but in most cases, when we came across a carcass like this, there was no external sign of indicating what killed that calf. Um, but unfortunately, there were several that died of starvation in 2018, which is why we added in all of those additional observation techniques that I talked about for 2020. So based on all of the observation teams combined, they had over 100 hours of observations on neonates and after calculating the results, we found no significant differences in how collared versus uncollared calves were treated. But we do plan to conduct a very similar, if not the exact same exercise next year. And so with that additional that data, we hope to be able to verify the impact or lack of impact of collaring the animal. After losing an unexpectedly high proportion of calves to various causes in 2019, we modified our project a little bit. So instead of catching 18-month-old females, we went after six-month-old calves. And by changing to this age group, we'd be able to determine the chances of a calf surviving its first winter. So in the fall of 2019, over the course of three days, we darted 25 calves out of the helicopter. When we captured an animal, we removed the dart and flushed the wound with an iodine solution. Each female received an expandable collar that will grow with her through adulthood, and the batteries on those collars should last six to seven years. Males, because we weren't sure how to compensate for their growth, received a fully expanded neonate collar, so the only uh, possibility left is that that collar will break apart and fall off. In addition, we put in these ear tag transmitters, which is the little yellow device in the left picture um, as you're looking at it, his right ear. So all of these devices allow us to relocate the animals and they have a mortality signal on them to tell us if that animal has stopped moving. In addition, all of the calves received an orange numbered ear tag. When they're fully grown, uh, we put out different colored ear tags each year. So if we come across three tagged individuals, that are adults know what age class they belong to. They were the 2019 cohort, 2020, or 2021. 
uh, we took hair and fecal samples from all of the calves and we took nasal swabs for disease testing. All of the calves received supplemental oxygen, which helped regulate their breeding while they were mobilized. And they were all given an antibiotic, which would help ward off any infection that might potentially take place um, or take hold in the animal because of our capture efforts. The last thing we did was weigh each calf and then we reversed the drugs and stood back and made sure the calves recovered and rejoined the herd before we left the area. So in 2019, the winter of 2019-2020, we only experienced 8% mortality in our calves. And because muskox like to continue to surprise us, all of the mortality we experienced happened at once. So when we went and visited the mortality scene, we found not one, not two, but five muskox carcasses frozen in the ice. Um, two of these belong to our collared calves. We were unable to dig through the snow or chip through the ice, so we ultimately had to make three trips out here to recover the collars. Um, but what we found by making those multiple trips is that it looks like this small herd of five muskox walked out onto some pretty thin ice that was covering a wetland. And then for whatever reason, they found a soft point and broke through the ice. And it was probably a combination of the soggy boggy wetland bottom and the easily breakable ice uh, that kept them there. They weren't able to get out of it. Um, and so the, the water from the wetland froze around them and kept them in really good shape actually until we were able to get out there this spring. So what's next? We continue to monitor all of our collared muskox on the Seward Peninsula um, at least once every third week through the rest of the summer. This fall we do plan to go out and catch more six-month-old cows they're six month old calves rather. And then next spring in 2021, we do plan to do one more year of neonate captures. So this is the last year of this project as well. And the future research projects are uncertain at the moment. But as we wrap up both years of these two projects, we plan to work with our research coordinator, our biologists and our biometrician to figure out the results and then where to take them from here. And just one other note, we always have res disease research going on in the background. So our wildlife veterinarian continues to monitor the herd of our muskox as well as other wildlife herds um, throughout Alaska for different diseases. So anybody on the Seward Peninsula or up in Cape Thompson that receives a muskox tag is asked to bring in the head of that animal so we can swab it for diseases. Uh, primarily, we look at pneumonia, but after this year, we might also be looking for COVID, hard to say. So far, however, so good. Um, all of our muskox appear to be healthy and not coming down with any new or problematic diseases. So with that, I will happily take any questions that you guys might have. And Bryn, would you like the questions in the text box or should that gonna work the best? Um, sure, or if you want to read them out, that's fine. I guess maybe you should read them because I don't see a text box. So if anyone has any questions, there's a chat box towards the bottom. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Beck. Um, Beck wants to know how difficult are the winters for them? Are they mainly starving and, and miserable all winter? Not really. They're really, really well adapted for surviving the cold winters. Um, that kiviet, that warm under fur, keeps them super warm. Actually, it's really easy for them to overheat in temperatures that we consider warmer, like freezing or above, 32 or above, they actually will overheat fairly easy. Um, in addition, they also really minimize their movement and will ruminate a lot more in the winter time. So they decrease their activity so that they're not expending as much energy as they would in the summer. You would like to know, why do baby muskox, <laughs> this is adorable, not have clothes from Nomi, age four? 
Muskox calves do not need clothes. Uh, again, they have lots and lots of warm fur. So they're born with warm fur as well. And they can also hide under their mom. That long skirt on their mom also provides warmth for them. So they don't need clothes. Corey wants to know, are there any plans to research the other two population areas? Yes and no. Uh, we certainly want to get out there and do some research, but right now we don't have any set plans or set items that need researched at the moment. Um, but that is moving forward, certainly something that we're going to look into. Wilson is wondering about the calf mortality due to birth defects and he um, wondering has anyone mused on inbreeding depression in Alaska's wild muskox populations given the small founding population? That's a great question. Um, again, yes and no. We do suspect that there's a little bit of inbreeding going on, um, but we have not yet looked at the genetic component of our wild population. Um, one thing I'm doing in the background, whenever we come across a mortality or when the hunters from Nunavak submit their samples, um, I take a small section of tissue and I store it in something called desiccant. And then down the road, uh, once I get a good number of samples, we'll send those off for genetic testing and, and try to get an idea of what the diversity looks like. Um, but it is suspected that the genetic diversity or lack thereof is partially to blame for those birth defects. Cannon is wondering about, um, you've spoken about the minerals missing from their diets, um, and he was wondering if that was specific to that herd or if it was spread out over the entire island. That's also a great question. We do not get locations of where the animals are harvested. So aside from knowing that they were taken from Nunavak Island, uh, we don't know if those animals that are deficient all came from the same small herd or if they were from different locations. Um, I, I'm not sure how we could figure that out short of asking for locations, um, but a lot of hunters are, are rather careful about the locations that they provide. So I'm not sure we would ever be able to figure that one out. Um, Cannon had another question. He's wondering um, for the baby muskox that were found deceased that had collars on them, do you think there was any chance that the mothers rejected them due to human interference? There certainly is. Um, you know, after the high number of mortalities we saw in 2019, and unfortunately quite a few of those were starvation, it really made us second guess ourselves. So after the pilot year in 2018, all of the calves that we captured that year were taken back in and no abandonment was seen. Um, so we progressed like we thought we could and saw a high number of starvation. So that's why we kind of took a step back in 2020 and added in all of those observations. Um, and we just spent more time making sure those calves reunited or if they ran off in different directions, we spent time making sure they were together before we left the area. Jamie wants to know um, the results you've gotten from their liver on trace minerals. Have you compared it to other species? Is there a baseline close to any other species? Great question. Um, we have looked at them in comparison to things like domestic sheep and domestic cattle, but they also seem to be all over the place in comparison to the domestic animals. Um, there are some studies out there with liver mineral levels in domestic muskox, uh, but still, even those are all over the place. Um, so what we're really taking away from that is there just needs to be more results obtained. So more locations need to look at that as well so we can get a good baseline information on it. Seems to be the consensus anytime we talk about muskox is we always need more information, which is great. Agreed. <laughs> uh, 
she is wondering, do you guys test for anything else in their guard hairs besides cortisol and progesterone levels? Not right now, but as I mentioned, um, they store information um, as long as those hairs are grown. So it's just a matter of determining what would be informative and then how to get it out of there and how to make sense of the results. So um, hunters are providing a, a really good amount of hair. And so we're only using two or three to look at stable isotopes. We'll only use two or three hairs to look at cortisol and progesterone, which leaves a lot of hair left behind for the future. So as more questions come up of what we should look for, we can go back and use these samples that are collected now. All right, doesn't seem like we have any more questions. So Bryn, thank you so much for joining us from Gnome and um, teaching us all about muskox and what you guys are doing out there. It's amazing research and we are so lucky to have researchers like you in the field been able to add to the wealth of knowledge that we need to have about these guys. Um, they're such an amazing part of our state. So thank you so much and thank you everyone who joined us today. It was wonderful to virtually get to see you all. Yes, thank you for having this and for giving me the opportunity to present. I enjoyed it.